to our interim executive director, Andrea Jones, who is also our senior director of conservation. Thank you, Shine. And I first want to start by thanking all of you and our entire team. This is our staff at Audubon California. Also, thank you, whether you're a chapter member, a regular member, a friend, a supporter, a volunteer, or interested, you've contributed to all the work we're talking about today. And uh, we can't do this alone. We're a community of conservationists throughout California and beyond. So thank you to everyone that's joining this call today. Next slide. I'm gonna just give you a little bit of a background on where we work, as I realize there may be people more or less uh, familiar with Audubon California's work in California. I should start by saying that we are a state office of the National Audubon Society, and uh, we are a staff of about 50 in California, but we're supported by 49 independent chapters throughout the state um, who are affiliated with us and really contribute tremendously to our work on the ground. The main places we work are in this map. The first one is our coasts. Um, we work along our coastline and our marine environment to protect estuary habitats, particularly eelgrass. And we also work on policies to ensure that there's equal access for all to nature along our coastline. Our Central Valley work is a large program and uh, we work on conservation ranching, which is a program designed to work with the ranching community to protect habitat for declining grassland birds and oak woodland birds. We also work on securing water for wetlands in the Central Valley. And we have a really unique bird returns program, which puts water on the landscape, on farmlands and on duck clubs during migration when birds need it most so that shorebirds and waterfowl have a place to stop in the Central Valley, which has lost most of its natural wetlands having these water sources available during migration is extremely important for their survival as they travel to places as far as South America. We also have a tricolor blackbirds program. This is a state threatened species. I'll talk more about that in a little minute. Next, we our climate program covers all of our work in California. Mike's going to talk about that a little bit more, but we work on everything from ensuring that there's state funding available for uh, resilient coastlines and resilient communities and habitats throughout the state. We work on legislation and 30 by 30 to ensure that 30% of our lands and waters are protected by 2030. We have a desert program that covers the Mojave and Colorado deserts in Southern California. And our flagship program there is our Salt and Sea program. And we work on everything from habitat restoration to policy to community engagement down at the Salt and Sea. We also have a public lands program uh, working to help protect public lands throughout the desert ecosystems that are so important to migratory birds. And last but not least, we have an urban program centered at our Audubon Center at Debs Park and our Richardson Bay Audubon Center in San Francisco. And these centers have youth leadership programs to bring in the next generation of conservationists into our community. And we do community-led conservation projects. And I'll, I'll give you a highlight of a, a really cool recent one. Next slide. Our tricolor blackbird program works with farmers every year. Most tricolor blackbirds nest in the San Joaquin Valley on dairy farms. This year, we protected a record number of 177,000 birds in 16 colonies. That means we paid the dairy farmers to delay harvest of their crops so that the birds were successfully able to raise their young. Next slide. At the Richardson Bay Audubon Center, we have an Audubon Youth Leaders program made up of high school students, uh, around 20 every year, um, that we educate and bring into the conservation movement through the California Naturalist Certification Program. At the same time, we're engaging on science at our sites. We're installing MODIS towers. And if you don't know what, the, what those are, those are radio towers that pick up birds that are tagged. And we're also tagging birds so that we're picking up birds during migration and learning more about where they're stopping and where they're flying. And that helps with our conservation efforts. Next slide. We started a new program this year. It's a coastal leadership program and that's designed for early career post-college individuals or people that haven't gone to college. 
um, and they engage with us in a nine month program in the LA basin. We're hoping to expand this program in future years, but really enjoyed this uh, first year cohort of this group in LA. And I mentioned I would give you a good story about our center's work and our community-based conservation. At our Audubon Center at Debs Park, we not only work at the center, we work in parks surrounding the communities. And one is the Rio de Los Angeles State Park. This is a small pocket park along the LA River. And our team this last two years planted native plants that we grew in our native plant nursery. And part of our goal was to bring back the federally endangered least bells vireo into this urban environment. One year post restoration, we had two pairs of least bell vireos nesting in this little park and they fledged at least three young. So we're absolutely thrilled and it made it into the LA Times that we were able to bring this urban, this bird back into the urban environment. At the same time, we've been featured for our work on securing and protecting groundwater along the Kern River through our work at the Kern River Preserve. So we're getting a lot of media attention for some of our habitat work. Next slide. Some of you may have heard of this and if you contributed to this effort, we want to really thank you. Um, we are one of the groups co-leading the effort to designate the Chukwala National Monument. We're hoping this gets designated within the next six months and uh, it's sitting with the federal government right now. We, uh, thanks to you all, submitted over 50,000 comment letters and uh, support materials. And that's really important to show that the local communities and the people of California think that designating this national monument is really important. It protects habitat, it protects um, cultural heritage sites, and it protects areas that are used um, to this day by local tribes. And, um, you know, it's over 600,000 acres and it's on the east side of the Salton Sea. Next slide. Also in the good news department, um, just this past week, the Chumash Heritage National Marine Sanctuary was designated by the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. This is the first tribally co-led marine sanctuary in the country. It's also the third largest marine sanctuary. And this is going to be co-managed by the Chumash um, and other tribes, as well as the NOAA for protection of cultural resources and important marine resources, such as whales and brown pelicans. We're absolutely thrilled. And again, your support helped us get there with over 10,000 support letters. Next slide. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Mike Kleins, our public policy director. Thanks. Thanks, Andrea. Yes, I'm Mike Lyons. I'm the policy director here at Audubon, California, and I've been here for about 10 years. Previous to that, I was at the Golden Gate Bird Alliance for about six years. And uh, what I want to do is talk a little bit about some of our policy wins here. And really what Andrea is saying and what I'm saying leads us right into why we think the bond is so urgent. So thanks for bearing with us as we give you some of this groundwork. We just felt it was important to understand the scope of our work and how Prop 4 really touches on and enables a lot of the work collectively we want to do. So a couple of policy wins from this year. First, I just want to thank people that engaged. We had over 14,000 collective actions to support our legislative and policy actions here in the state of California this year. And that led to the passage of Senate Bill 583 from Senator Padilla down in San Diego that creates the Salton Sea Conservancy. The Conservancy, by the way, is one of the things that would be funded by Prop 4. Also, we helped pass uh, Assembly Bill 2875, which establishes it as the policy of California that there be no net loss of wetlands and there be long-term gain of wetlands. And again, in order to get long-term gain of wetlands, we need investments like the kind I'm going to be talking about in Prop 4 in just a second. Next slide, please. A couple of other quick wins. We, these just happened within the last week and we wanted to share them because we had you as an audience. Uh, first of all, the California Fish and Game Commission last Thursday unanimously declared that the uh, Western Burley Now is a candidate for listing under the California Endangered Species Act. And as a candidate, it will be given full protections for the next year as Department of Fish and Game does an assessment. And I really want to thank uh, the partners that put forward this petition. That was the Center for Biological Diversity, Defenders of Wildlife, uh, the Burrowing Owl Preservation uh, Society, and also a couple of uh, leading chapters, Santa Clara Bird Alliance, San Bernardino Valley Audubon Society, 
um, as well as uh, urban birds and the Central Valley Bird Club. So this is an example of where the chapters really stepped up and, um, and uh, helped lead this petition. Now during this one year period, they will do an evaluation about whether a full listing will be required. And we think once they look at, take a hard look at the science for the next year, in a, a year from now, they will give it permanent protection. The other big win, uh, and this is really uh, uh, in large part due to our coastal program lead, Liliana Griego, is um, the California Coastal Commission rejected an effort by SpaceX. Uh, you may know them as Elon Musk's space company that launches a lot of rockets. They want to increase the number of launches happening at Vandenberg Air Force Base, uh, a significant amount. Uh, and this is all for-profit corporate launches. Uh, and it will have direct impacts on nesting uh, snowy plovers and California least terns, both threatened species. And the Coastal Commission and uh, many groups like Audubon really wanted to put the brakes on to understand what the impacts were going to be and the mitigation and requiring them to do real mitigation, just as we would in any other endeavor that affected uh, threatened species. Uh, go ahead, next slide. All right, so that all brings me to why are we working on Prop 4? And uh, you'll see it on the ballot as Proposition 4, the Safe Drinking Water, Wildlife Prevention, Drought Preparedness, and Clean Air Bond Act of 2024. All those words are carefully chosen to capture people and talk about the major portions of the bond. Uh, Audubon has been working on this bond for five years in one form or another. And in the last year and a half, we've bound it together with over 180 other environmental justice and conservation organizations to come forward and work on language and get it through the legislature and get the governor to sign it. Current polls show over 60 or 65 percent, depending on which polls you look at, for the bond. So it's polling really well in California's poll. Uh, Californians tend to like natural resource bonds. That said, this is why we're having this, uh, this webinar to educate uh, our members about it, to encourage you to vote for it, to encourage you to uh, get other Audubon members and other people in your communities to support it. Um, all right, so why, why do we need this now? Well, first and foremost, Audubon understands that we need climate action now and significant investments in all of these areas right now. Uh, you may have seen the survival by degrees report that Audubon did several years ago, but climate change puts at risk about two thirds of North, Americans bird, North American bird populations at a greater risk of extirpation or extinction. And that includes over 200 species here in California. And so we know that we need to take action on climate and a lot of what's baked into Prop 4 is around taking action on climate change and making us more resilient. The other part of why it's needed now is the state is in a budget decline and we have seen real restrictions in the amount of money going to key agencies like the Wildlife Conservation Board. They have frozen, uh, they don't have not been receiving and processing new grant applications for about the last six months uh, because they basically run out of money and they depend on the bonds to do it. Now we can talk about whether this should be part of the general fund. We're constantly working on that. But the fact of the matter is California funds natural resource and climate action through these kind of bond instruments. We also know, oh, sorry, last yeah. We also know that the kind of investments that Prop 4 is talking about actually work. When Prop uh, 1 passed in 2014, there was $100 million in there that we got for Central Valley wetlands that went directly to creating and providing water to more of the wetlands in the Central Valley, which has already lost 95% of its wetland habitat. So we know we can put these bond dollars to work in ways that'll be efficient and provide benefits for birds and people. I also wanna note that we worked really hard with partners to make sure that this was the most equitable natural resource bond that's ever been done. And there's 40% of the funds must be spent in disadvantaged and frontline communities. Uh, this includes a lot of rural areas. It also includes a lot of urban areas, which I'll talk about in just a moment. Lastly, we know that it's better to invest upfront in planning and resilience than dealing with the emergency of wildfires or the emergency of floods and sea level rise. And so if we can make the investments now, we will save, our, save a lot of money for the state and for the future. Next slide, please. So just a quick background for those of you not very familiar with the bonds, the bonds, you know, the California uh, passes a bond, the voters vote on it, and then that allows the state of California to sell uh, bond instruments to investors. So we basically are borrowing them, that money. Uh, that money must be spent on infrastructure. So it's spent on, in the past, we've done it for roads and school buildings and bridges and things like that. 
In the natural resource area, we do it on long-term or permanent protections for land, so land acquisition. Also water infrastructure um, and forest management that's gonna provide more forest stability over a long-term. Uh, processes of sea level rise, like more natural shorelines that are more absorbent to sea level rise, things like that. So it has to be spent on infrastructure. It can't be spent on things like education. There's a little budget in there for planning and for science. But what we find is when we get the bond dollars, then it frees up other parts of the state budget to fund things like science, education programs, and the like. Uh, the uh, past bonds that Audubon California has been involved with, you can see a list here. I just wanted to include this to remind folks that this is something that we have done over the last 20 years, and we've done it with a lot of success and seen a lot of real progress on the ground. Next slide. So this is a lot of words, but what we wanted to do here was just give you a sense. There's several different chapters in the bond, and each of those has uh, a big number associated with it. So 3.8 billion for water, including safe drinking water, but also flood and water deliveries. That money that I talked about for Central Valley refuges and the Salton Sea is in that 3.8 billion. Uh, 1.5 for wildfire resilience, 1.2 for sea level rise and coastal resilience, biodiversity 1.2, and there's some other numbers there uh, that you can see as well. So these are large numbers that go into big buckets and then underneath in those chapters, it gets more detailed about how those dollars are gonna spend. Next slide. So well, an example I wanted to give you from the 1.2 billion for biodiversity and nature-based climate solutions, there's $870 million for the Wildlife Conservation Board. For those of you not familiar, the Wildlife Conservation Board is probably one of the primary funders for restoration projects, habitat acquisition, and easement acquisition in the state. And so when I mentioned earlier that they have a freeze right now on grants because their budget has been shrunk, this is the kind of money we're talking about, making sure that this money goes out the door to Wildlife Conservation Board, as well as to conservancies like the Sierra Nevada Conservancy, uh, San Gabriel Mountains Conservancy, and many other places across the state. And these conservancies know how to put those dollars on the ground to benefit the habitats and their communities. Next slide. Uh, sea level and coastal resilience. This 1.2 billion for coastal uh, coastal programs. Now, you know, one of the things I was looking up is just in San Francisco Bay alone, the estimated cost by 2050 for uh, uh, for sea level rise costs could exceed $110 billion if the flood damage happens to all of that property and, and uh, all those people and people needing to back off offside the bay. Now, there's a lot of different solutions there, but that's just one example that if we don't prepare for resilience, we're going to get hit with these big dollars down the road. This money is also really important for coastal estuaries and um, restoration projects like that we have uh, that we've already been doing across uh, like Mission Bay down in San Diego has received bond dollars in the past in order for the rewilding project to create a large wetland there. Next slide. The river streams and lake, I noted that as 3.8 billion overall uh, in this water area, um, a lot of that is for safe drinking water. There's still over uh, a million Californians that lack access to safe and affordable drinking water, and that's too many, and we Audubon supports getting that number down. But also for things in here about um, how we're going to protect things like the Sacramento River and the San Joaquin River, making these riparian corridors healthier, more flood resilient, uh, more resilient to climate change. And then also, as we know, with riparian habitat and wetlands, then you just see bird numbers go off the charts when you restore these areas. Next slide. Parks and outdoor access. I think for a lot of our Audubon chapters and members, this 700 million is really exciting because this is how you can see it land directly in your communities where you live. Uh, this is the kind of money when Andrea was talking about the work that Debs Park has done on the LA River. This is the kind of money that helps get those trees, to build those parklets, that creates habitat for species like the least bells vertigo. Also, it's what helps get people outdoors. And I'll tell you as someone that's worked on this policy you know, in Ottawa, California for the last 10 years, we need to continue to build a constituency of people who care about the outdoors, that show up, that see it, that hear the birds sing, and then they vote for people that make the decisions around the budgets. They get us the kind of money we need for conservation in the state. Next slide. Lastly, I'll note that uh, on the Salton Sea, uh, you know, we continue to work out there that this project will probably be over 2 billion total uh, for making sure we have enough habitat and dust control at the Salton Sea as it continues to shrink. And 170 million in the Salton Sea budget come, will come out of this bond. 
Um, so we can talk a lot more about the Salton Sea. It's near to, and dear to Andrea and my heart. But again, just you can see how this money will pass through the bond and go directly into a project Audubon cares about. Next slide. So we've been hearing some frequently asked questions throughout this process about, for example, how will the, how will the bond help birds? I think most of you now probably have a sense of that when I'm talking about all these habitat projects and everything, and uh, and also trying to build climate resilience so that we can push back against uh, extinction or extirpation of two thirds of birds in North America. So uh, it's really clear that these pro this money will land in places like the Wildlife Conservation Board, Department of Fish and Wildlife, and result in projects that create habitat that help birds. How will it help communities? Well, one, there's a lot of additional things that are outside the scope of what Audubon's focused on, the safe drinking water. There's projects to reduce the impacts of extreme heat, especially in places like Southern California and the Central Valley. Extreme heat costs us millions and millions of dollars a year. It's killed hundreds of people over the last 10 years, and it'll, it's going to get worse. And so this has an investment in that. From an Audubon perspective as well, when we create more natural areas, when we improve biodiversity, when we have nature-based re climate resilience programs, this helps people, it exposes them to nature, gives them all those benefits of nature, and it makes their, uh, their communities more resilient. How will it be paid for? As I mentioned, these bonds uh, will be sold to investors who will then, um, uh, 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 so we basically are borrowing that money and then we have to pay that back with interest. This is one of the things I do not love about bonds because we're borrowing for the natural resources. But the fact of the matter is that even with the interest that we pay, the investment is better made now than waiting for the emergencies later or seeing our species go extinct or be extirpated. And what accountability measures are in place? So there's several. First of all, the state has actually gotten really good. And I will say this as someone who is as cynical about bureaucracy as anybody else, but the state has gotten very good about reporting how bond dollars are being spent. They maintain a website. All the agencies have to report into that. And you can track how bond dollars have been spent going back over the last 20 years. But also, and this is one of the areas where we in the policy shop work, is state legislators are watching, will watch where this money goes. And they will want to make sure, for example, that that 40% is going to disadvantaged and frontline communities. They will want to make sure that 870 million at Wildlife Conservation Board is getting out in an expeditious way to projects that create habitat and create resilience. So we'll be working with state legislators to provide some oversight through oversight hearings and reports and the like. With that, uh, I will uh, pass on to Shani. Thanks, Mike. Real quick on the how will it be paid for question, I just wanted to clarify that um, we had we had gotten a question about if this will uh, require additional taxes. Right. There's not an expectation that this bond is will increase California's taxes or all. It, the, it gets folded into the general fund. And frankly, it's such a small amount of our total budget that this bond is not the thing that's going to affect people's taxes one way or the other. Okay. So it just gets budgeted into the, yeah. the overall fund. Okay, great. And um, just a reminder, folks, that uh, I, I see some people have added questions to the Q&A. Please keep that up. Um, and we will, in just a few minutes, get to the Q&A. So Mike, also go ahead and feel free to look at those as well in, in preparation. So real quick, before we um, get to your questions, I wanted to share a little bit about what Audubon California is doing on the camp on the bond so that you all could participate as well. Hopefully you have already seen some of our communications. You got this email invite to the webinar. Um, we are going all in on yes for on four because we believe that four is gonna be four birds, four people and for our shared future. As part of that, we are educating folks, uh, we are engaging people, and we are activating people. We're educating folks through our webpage, which you should be able to see at the bottom of your screen, a little button that says resources. Um, and you can find links to all of our all of our materials that we're showing here. So we have some blogs up that kind of break down the bond in more detail, a little bit of basically what Mike told us here today. Um, so that you can share with other people about why this bond is important and how that money will be used. You can also find some quick facts and some other FAQs on our webpage and join our social campaign. We're educating folks through our one pagers and our other materials. These are also available for all of you if you would like to use them, if you have upcoming events or things that um, you could either post it online or print out and share. 
We're engaging folks by asking them to participate. Uh, we know that people are really much more likely to actually do a thing if they pledge that they're going to do it. So we would love for you all to go ahead and pledge that you will be voting yes, or let us know if you already have. We have um, a really quick and easy sign up form. It takes 30 seconds and um, it will give you some language to share your vote and let people know, hey, I'm, I'm voting for Prop 4, will you join me? We're activating all of our people on social and uh, I would love for you all to take 30 seconds to um, go to Instagram and look up Audubon CA if you're not following us already because it is full of beautiful bird photos as well as updates about all the great work we're doing across the state. But we're asking people on, on our social media channels to share with us why why they love California, what they are excited about saving and protecting using this bond. Um, and we've seen some really great uh, responses and we know that, you know, California is a beautiful place. It's a really special place. And there's a lot of things that we love about it together, including our birds. It's been great to see some of our partners and followers really um, share and get excited about the bond. The Golden Gate Bird Alliance, for example, is one of our many chapters who have already come out in strong support and are rallying their audiences. And of course, some of our, our followers who also happen to be wonderful photographers. So I just wanna take this moment to please ask you all to, after this um, webinar, Get involved. Uh, what can you do to activate your friends and family? I know that climate change can feel like an overwhelming challenge that we can't have any say in, but this is a real tangible opportunity for us to have an impact on, on the investments we know that need to happen right now. We are seeing every month almost some sort of drastic weather and climate challenge happening. So we know that it needs to change now to protect the state that we love and the communities that we care about. So we're asking you to share your stories and your voice. Um, let us know through our channels what this bond means to you and what you're fighting for. Feel free to use our materials, our content, our blogs, our one pager to educate your network and get social with us, follow us and repost. Um, and of course, get out the vote, have those conversations with your friends and family uh, about why this bond matters between now and November 5th. I've got my mail-in ballot already, so hopefully um, some of you all can begin to take action right away. So thank you all so much for your patience as we've uh, shared all this really important information with you. We hope you found it interesting and illuminating. Uh, we'll take a moment to go through some of your questions right now. And I am looking through the Q&A. Okay, and Mike already answered this question that Juliet asked, does Prop 4 require two thirds vote for passage or just 50%? And it only requires 50%. And Mike, if you um, can go ahead and if, look at the questions that are in there um, and let yeah, us know if you'd like. Yeah. Sure. So uh, there's one question about um, once it's approved, how will the state distribute the funds? So if you actually look at the at the Prop 4 language itself, or you can look up the underlying Senate bill, Senate bill 867 in California, uh, you can see how the funds are distributed. And there's, uh, there are these buckets, for example, the 1.2 for coastal or the 1.2 for biodiversity is probably a better example. Of that, $870 million is going to the Wildlife Conservation Board. And then you look under that chapter for the Wildlife Conservation Board and it designates um, something like 400 million or so that, that is then further split to a bunch of different conservancies across the state. So the bond itself has some large buckets with discretion to the agencies. Uh, so the and then the um, and then some of that is actually tied in to sort of budget lines where they have to spend it on particular uh, things like a particular conservancy. And then um, that money that will be then appropriated will be put into the governor's budget, and then that budget is negotiated and approved uh, by the legislature. So those are all the steps that it takes before that money goes out the door. 
Uh, let's see, sorry, I'm kind of reading this too. Um, by the way, if uh, uh, I think someone might have corrected, I might have used the wrong number for Prop 68, uh, but if, if I did, I apologize on that. We can try to check that. That might have just been a typo on my part. Um, uh, Juliet asked whether Prop 4 would be applied for new wildlife connectivity requirements. And the answer is yes, that's exactly the kind of thing that we need to do. And it was one of the questions around some of the wildlife bills that we had this year, including the Salton Sea Conservancy, was we're not sure they would have passed uh, if, um, if we didn't have bond dollars that would have been ready to be lined up and starting to, to run out of the next budget. Uh, because I'll tell you, having worked on state legislation through two bad budget years the last two years, any bill that has substantial costs associated with it just dies in one of the appropriations committees. So having bond dollars out there ready to go is really important. Um, uh, I see a question about wildlife connectivity requirements. I'm not sure if that's... Oh, that's the one I just tried to answer for Julia. Oh. Yeah. Um, uh, I will say, Jennifer raised a question about, um, I think about the Tijuana River and some pollution. There is actually money in the bond to be working on cleanup on the Tijuana River, which is, I know San Diego Bird Alliance has been a big issue for them and they've worked on that as well. Uh, and there's a question from Marty about how how much has sea level r rise risen in the past 30 years? Marty, I could Google that for you really quick. I don't have it off the top of my head. I'm sorry. Uh, but we know that it's continuing to rise. All the Our friends at Point Blue actually put together a map a couple of years ago just on the San Francisco Bay. And the amount of land that it was already starting to cover was extremely worrisome. That's all I see in Q&A right now, Shanine. Uh, maybe there's some more. I know people were asking questions in chat. I can bring that up too. So Steve asked a question about how much of the funds will go to the Center for Biological Diversity. Uh, Steve, the, uh, the Center for Biological Diversity is a nonprofit organization. If CBD wanted to apply for a grant, like say at the Wildlife Conservation Board, if they had a project, they could get it like anybody else. But there's no money. There's no money in this that directly goes to any single entity like Audubon or CBD or the Nature Conservancy. This sets up programs at state agencies. Often there are grant programs associated with these that allow an entity like Audubon or CBD or someone else to apply for a grant and then maybe get that money. And I just wanted to follow up um, just a uh, data point that I just looked up real quick is that sea levels in California are predicted to rise between one half to three meters by tw uh, the year 2100. Okay, so I think that um, covers all of the questions that we have seen so far. Feel free if anyone has anything else. Okay, we got a question from Gary uh, about what groups are against this prop. Uh, right now, there hasn't been real strong opposition uh, the Howard Jarvis Taxpayers Association has been the primary one that has raised uh, concerns. They, as a as a uh, practice, pretty much oppose all bonds um, and uh, and really anything that they see that's on the ballot that would, that might affect uh, the general fund and tax rates. But there, I will say that um, there was no opposition, uh, significant opposition, other than the Howard Jarvis folks as we move through the legislature. Uh, it had a strong support. Um, there were some Republican lawmakers that spoke out against it, um, but it also had um, some support. I mean, they. Uh, it's interesting, even for those Republican lawmakers, their primary constituents, like the water agencies and farmers and everything, either stayed neutral or, or some even supported. So there's a concern uh, I just see here about the, um, uh, you know, some investments. So we've heard some of this, like investments to Cal Fire, right? We have concerns and Audubon has very deep concerns about how Cal Fire practices forest management in some places, especially down in coastal scrub. Uh, likewise, we've heard some concerns like, well, there's money in here that will go to facilitate offshore wind. And we all have concerns about offshore wind. 
And many of you know Gary George, uh, who now is our National Renewable Energy Director. He and I were talking about offshore wind today, actually. And um, you know, these are things that Audubon is working on on a policy front. Um, if there is, so for example, on the offshore wind, there's money that will go to ports. And a big part of that money that's going to go to ports is actually not really about the offshore wind, so much as modernizing those ports and making sure that they are zero emission, because ports are a huge source of air pollution that negatively affects the people that live around there. There's actually some exciting developments uh, that's happening up at the Humboldt County Port, in part to get ready for potentially for offshore wind. But it's being a group that's engaged up there is uh, NGOs and tribal representatives in a group called Core Hub to make that a zero emission green port. Um, and that's something that Audubon, EDF, NRDC, and others really support, regardless of the offshore wind context. On offshore wind, we have to look at that and engage and figure out how do we avoid and mitigate the impacts to birds as we look at that as a potential viable renewable energy source that we also may need because we've got to get off fossil fuels. So uh, I would say that there you can find in any bond like some concerns about how will this how will the money be spent, and I would suggest like look at the total ten billion, understand those benefits, and then also where we have concerns about programs like offshore wind, let's engage to avoid and mitigate those costs to the extent possible. I'll tell you from experience, we're not going to starve Cal Fire if we don't like how Cal Fire is doing business. Cal Fire is going to get money to go out there and do its management. Where we have to make changes on a group like Cal Fire is actually. In, engaging with CAL FIRE, doing, demonstrating the science on how to avoid and mitigate the impacts of what they're doing, and do prevention work, which what this bond do, does, do that prevention work before we have emergency fires and CAL FIRE takes extreme measures that reduce habitat in ways we don't approve of. So just wanted to flag that, that this is not, you know, these investments go across the state, they're really important. Uh, and if we don't like sometimes how agencies do things, we need to engage in a policy way to improve those. Sorry, I'm looking at some questions again. Uh, I will. I just talked a bit about offshore wind. There's not. It's not 10% of the funding will go towards offshore wind, Gail. And I don't want to debate with you. I'm happy to talk to you further about it. I, as someone who I've worked on the Altamont Pass, if folks are from the Golden Gate Bird Alliance are here, you can see the scars on my face of having worked on onshore wind for over 15 years, and also on on I work on solar issues. I care very much about birds. Um, so I wouldn't say this lightly, but I also say that there's there's about 500 million that's gonna go into ports that could help for offshore wind. But um, offshore wind is gonna happen regardless of whether this money, that money is in there. And if, you, if we don't pass Prop 4, we're gonna lose out on all this other money that I was talking about that we know we need to build resilient bird populations and to benefit people and reduce the impacts from climate change. Miguel, I'm happy to talk further if you want to follow up or anybody. And we had a question from Carolyn in the chat. Um, uh, she says, thank you for your collective work for saving our bird populations. Are there things we can do in our neighborhoods? Andrea, do you want to jump in on this one? Sure. I did put an answer in the chat, but I can expand on it. I mean, you know, all the things Shine has talked about, telling your neighbors about this proposition would be great. But it was specifically um, providing habitat for birds, particularly in the winter and during migration and periods of drought is incredibly important. Whether you have a patio, um, you're in an apartment building or you have a yard, um, putting out a plant, whether it's a hanging plant or planting native plants that are drought tolerant that provide food sources for birds and for pollinators is incredibly important and does a lot to improve habitat conditions and uh, for birds as they migrate. We have a great online database it's for the public called Plants for Birds. You can put in your zip code and it will tell you what plants to plant for which species and where you can actually buy those plants at your local nurseries. And this is not a question about the bond, but I just wanted to say it out loud since um, I think our chats to Jennifer are not going through. Jennifer had a question before about why there's only one year of protection for the burrowing owl. So to be clear, that is a temporary one year as the um, 
as the commission reviews the science behind whether to declare it or not. So hopefully that um, provides some clarity. So after the year of review, so it's it's providing that temporary protection, then it will be decided whether the, the burring owl gets the endangered or threatened protections permanently. Great. I see a couple more. I know we're just at time, so you, you can cut me off, Shine, but I can answer a couple of these questions quickly if you like. So, uh, um, uh, Marty asked about uh, cleaning up the Tijuana River is not necessarily a capital improvement, yet this would be, in this case, operations and maintenance. They're not always covered by bond dollars, Marty, but what we're talking about there is actually some capital infrastructure changes to make that Tijuana River uh, cleaner and better. So uh, my understanding is that money can go towards that. Um, Louis, uh, Luis had an, a question about the state grant programs. Is it for only the capital infrastructure programs? And yes, for the most part it is. But I'll give you an example. Uh, there, we had a picture of this, uh, the Dos Rios State Park, the newest state park in the Central Valley, right? So that went to a nonprofit to do the planting, the earth moving, everything else necessary to create that park. So there's a lot of infrastructure work that NGOs can do. It could go to a place like Debs to grow the plants that would be put into a parklet at LA River because you're the, growing a plant is kind of a piece of infrastructure. And then uh, David brought up the concern about the fuel reduction. David, this is what I was saying about Kyle Fire. We share those concerns. There's responsible ways to do fuel reduction. And actually, the bond has some very nice language about using uh, sustainable methods like um, uh, in the appropriate places, doing prescribed fire, using some ind indigenous knowledge about where that, where that works and where it doesn't, using things like grazing strategically to mimic natural processes, not overgrazing, again, as a bird biologist, I get worried about grazing, but the but proper grazing, the way we talk about it in our conservation ranching program, can reduce the fuel load in a natural way, and you see native plant and bird numbers skyrocket. So, um, and lastly, we agree we have to be careful about what we do in nesting season. There are protocols and laws in place, and that's really an issue of policy. Uh, and then the last thing I see from Ronnie is about does it help with light pollution? And Ronnie, I don't know that this bond will help us with light pollution, though. Uh, there could be some money in here that would help do some of that for um, more more efficiencies in energy efficiencies. And we know that energy efficient lights, if they're managed well, can actually reduce the light impacts on birds. But we had a bill the last couple of years uh, that didn't go forward that we're looking at maybe doing in 2025. So you may see more work on light pollution from us next year. Uh, I did see Don had a question about how it will impact taxpayers. And so, as I was saying, Don, this is added to California's overall indebtedness, which is far larger than this bond. So this is sort of a, almost even a rounding error as far as California's overall tax, tax debt. That we chose, when we worked together with all these other groups, we had over $25 billion in legitimate asks, natural resource, clean water, and environmental justice needs that needed to happen. Um, all these groups came together, we put our numbers, and that was after we crunched down our numbers a bit. And we just understood that the indebtedness that California would take on for a $25 billion bond, when it's also doing housing and education bonds and other issues, we just couldn't responsibly propose that level of bond this year. So this went through the Department of Finance, was vetted with a bunch of others, and um, and so it was at $10 billion uh, in order. That was what Department of Finance at the state considered to be a reasonable amount that we could incorporate into California's general indebtedness to pay back without having an adverse impact on the tax taxpayers. And again, for what it's worth, the investment we make now will save us on those costs, taxpayer costs later. All right. Thank you all so much for the really great questions and engagement. We hope that uh, you've all learned a lot. I've actually learned a few things myself just from hearing Mike talk and share his expertise. So we really appreciate it. Um, we know that this bond has so many great things and uh, for our communities, for the birds that we care about. Um, so we hope that you will join us on this journey. Please do uh, follow us on Instagram, on Facebook. If you're not already um, 
uh, part of our newsletter. Uh, you can sign up for that on our website at ca.audubon.org. This webinar is recorded and we will share out the recording with everyone after this call as well. Thank you all so much. Really appreciate your time. Um, and we hope that you will be voting yes on Prop 4. Thank you, everyone.